Hello and welcome to the James Grandstrom podcast, Super Soul Model Series. This week on the show, I have Tony Wormsley, a high performance coach specialist. Tony is an expert. He is a former professional football manager for the Aussie A League. And in the UK, he's worked with the Man United Academy and Sheffield United Academy. Welcome to the show, Tony Wormsley. James, thanks very much for having me. It's an absolute privilege to be here. Fantastic to have you on the show. Tony, you, you, you help people and coach them um, to be able to turn teams around and individuals around because why most people fail to achieve high performance, you have found a solution for that. You have like found a set of principles that actually help people transition from one state to another. And with all your expertise working in the Aussie A-League and with you know, the academies for Sheffield and Man United, you know, I'm really interested to listen to your story, as I'm sure my audience are, to find out what your findings are about how people can pivot from underperforming to performing at extremely high levels, particularly under pressure. Um, Tony, tell us a little bit about your background so we can understand a little about you and, and uh, get to know your story, my friend. Yeah, I mean, you know, to firstly, talk about landing on solutions. I think that's evolutionary. You know, I'm, I'm constant. I think I've spent my whole life curious about how to get the best out of myself and, and, and being in a helping industry all my life, you know, firstly in football, then in business. Um, it, it's like, well, how do I, how do you do that? How do you optimize that? Who's been successful? Like Fer, Fergie, Mourinho, the, these guys are, you know, quintessentially successful people that everybody knows about, but, but why is that not repeatable for everybody else? And it's a constant source of inspiration for me. And that goes back to 1988 when I flew out from, from England to Australia for the first time um, as, a, as a player coach, you know, very raw 21 year old, um, ro rocked into Tasmania, which couldn't be any further from, from Manchester. Good old Tassie. Um, and, yeah, good old Tassie. And, and, you know, walked into an airport um, and, and was confronted by TV cameras and, and newspapers with, with, with no notice, no preparation. And that started this, this colorful journey that I've had that, that took me to China, to India, to Southeast Asia, and of course, managing in the A-League and operations in the Asian Champions League, all, all sorts of great experiences in football. Um, and also, you know, throughout that journey, both sidestepping with an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit in tapping into business and seeing where I could stretch myself in, in other areas. Uh, and transitioning the business in a big way in around about eight years ago uh, into a completely, you know, life-changing situation where I found myself in practice underneath great big diesel trains, helping teams um, work out what a consistent level of high performance is. It, 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 it couldn't have been any more different than being on, on the grass in the sunshine of, of Australia to being you know, in Liverpool, working with a load of scousers on, on how to fix trains better. It's been, it's been pretty cool. <laughs> what a journey, mate. What a journey. Yeah. So, you know, in, in, in your journey of like discovering of underperformance for yourself and then high performance for yourself, can we, could you just tell us a little story of, of like how, how you've noticed the difference between when you've underperformed to high performance, whether it be just for yourself when managing teams, because if most people are failing to achieve high levels of performance, you must have found some sort of common denominator with your experience, you know, in your high managerial levels. And then what's worked and what hasn't worked? Yeah, I mean, there's loads to tap into there. Um, and I think, I think firstly, if I, if I talk about, about being present, like we are here, you know, we, I'm fully engaged with you. I'm, I want to understand what you mean by the questions you, that you're asking is an example of, of me being present in the situation. Uh, what, what, what tends to happen or what's happened in the past or what's happened when I'm, I'm working with people is they, they have memories of what's gone before, which are either good memories or bad memories. And, and in the context of performance, if you're gonna use that as a tool, it's about thinking about when, when were you at your best and what, what was happening. So that's a great thing to reflect on in the context of performance. Um, but it's not in the present, it's thinking about what happened before. And then of course, there's aspirational stuff, which is, I often live in the future, think, oh, what, what's possible? Wow, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do that? Come on, everybody, let's go. 
Now that that's my appetite for risk and that's my appetite for change and my appetite for, sure. for, for, for what's possible. Not everybody's ready to go there. And that was one of the big learnings for me. So between that future state, which is what high performance looks like in this context and the experience and the younger you are and the less experience you've had, the less ready you are to meet that high performance demand in a consistent way. So what you're um, saying is, that, is that that's all about, so to reach high levels of performance, it requires more experience. Is that what you're saying? It's, it's not exclusively the case, but, right. but for it to be repeatable, um, may, certainly in the context of a very complex environment, which a, a, a team sport is where you're confronted with dynamics that happen in split seconds, then if you're a young player that's going into into your debut in front of a 20,000 uh, people crowd, yeah. then there's lots of emotions at play that you wouldn't have dealt with before. You can train, sure. you can train the house down and become an, an expert technician. And then, and then what, what makes you not second guess yourself in that moment? And, and Tony, that's I'm about so being, excited that's to about talk to present. you. That's yeah. about being present. You Tony, know, I'm and- so excited to talk to you today. Um, you know, Tony and I have known each other for a few months now. And um, talking to Tony is so enjoyable for me because Tony has some incredible stories in his sports managerial career when he's been right up against it. And I want to see if we can extract those from you, Tony, and share with, uh, you know, the audience today some of your <laughs> tough challenging moments and how you dealt with them you know powerfully um under pressure um because you know some of this stuff you told me is like oh my golly that's quite a lot of pressure for someone who hasn't been in that position before um so you know what i love about the the james grantham podcast show and what i always try to do and share with my audience here is to tap into presence tap into well-being tap into positivity which is all great, but when you're under pressure and the external circumstances are in your face, as I call them, in your face productions, how do you, how do you respond in that moment when all eyes are on you? And um, could you just tell us a, a little story that you've had um, about how you dealt with something when all eyes were on you as a manager? And so we can share with the audience about how your perspective was those uncharted yeah, yeah. waters yeah I can. and uh, i guess there's loads of loads of anecdotes from the past and you know i was thinking in preparation for this about you know sharing some experiences with with your audience and if i think about just the just to frame this against a positive experience and i, I think of outcomes as being external to my control now mm as a young coach you're thinking about winning you've got your eye on the goal and you're driving people with the you know I used to be far more emotive on the sideline and and reactive to the situation colorful the language was different I was less composed than I am now and and I remember a game uh, in the you know leagues below where where I ended up at, in the A-League in Australia so sem- semi-professional I was a technical director of this fairly large uh, club with uh, operation Any, anyway we we were in the semi final and uh, no we we the, the winner of this game w- was going to go on to win the league so we, it was it was make or break last game of the season first v second we lost we we lost we won we won the league so th- this was exciting last minute of the game they get a penalty it's nil nil and i think it's curtains my goalkeeper saves the penalty, throws the ball out to the winger. We score on the counter-attack and win the league in the blink of an eye. Game over. Referee blows the final whistle. So, of course, I get mobbed. The players are mobbing each other and it's, it feels fantastic. And I, I get goosebumps thinking about it. That, that team I'm, I've got the, the greatest bond with, we still connect You know, many years later. But as a mature coach... On reflection, that's that that moment was out of my control completely. So that that that's the first thing, and and the, the why I'm framing this story with that is that I've I stopped measuring myself against external outcomes. 
and started to measure myself against who I was yesterday. That, that was the only way that I could get to where I wanted to go. Stop measuring myself against Ferguson, Mourinho, right. results, other people's expectations and start to go, okay, who, who, who are you being that is not good enough? Who, who are you being that, that doesn't reflect who you want to become? So that, that's the first thing. So that, take, take you back to this other game. So I'm now in the A-League. We're punching well above our weight. Um, we've got a load of kids in the team. We've got a small budget. We're playing against Sydney FC, the powerhouses of the comp- richest club in the competition. Sydney Football Stadium, my family's in the crowd, and we're two down after 15 minutes. My goalie gets a red card, down to 10 men. I've got a load of kids. Gosh, on the pressure. Field. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, expect- the, the only expectation probably in the general population at that time was, at what point am I going to get fired? Right. That that was probably the sense. You're thinking that oh, after like 15 minutes, Tony. Yeah, I was a fit. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. get much worse than you. Know, you know, it yeah. could be one of those games that blows out. To I see myself on the big screen and I'm reflecting. I'm I'm having the self talk about. It probably doesn't get. I was present. I was fully present in the moment. Right. It probably is not going to get much worse than this. So okay, we've got things to do. We get to the end of the game. It didn't turn out too bad. Four one four two. Yet another defeat. Crowd are going mad. Social media is going mad. All the rest of it. But sometimes you would have a straight after after the game, a live live to air TV interview, and this was one of those times. And you just they're just fairly not. It's par for the course. You're used to getting asked questions and and, and, and fielding yeah. the answers. But of course, when you're in an emotional state of any description, you've just won your high, or you just lost, or the referee did something crazy, and you're you're angry. Got to compose yourself and give a response because you yeah. don't know what's coming. Well, on this particular occasion, Mark Bosnich, uh, ex-Man United, Chelsea, now now one of the chief pundits in Australia, his first question to me, live live to air, was, "So, Tony, don't you think it's about time you resigned?" <laughs> God, <laughs> jeez, pressure. How many people in the crowd watching you with the spect with the, you know the pundit there? Um, the crowd, well, it's a live TV audience, so every every game was televised live. So I, I don't know what the TV audience was. Um, yeah. the, the the crowd was probably they usually fifteen to twenty thousand. Yeah, at, huge. At, at mate. Sydney FC, and you're on the jumbo screen, no doubt. There, you know, he's right in your face yeah. with a mic. But you know, these I, I believe that embracing some level of discomfort is a way to. You can familiarise yourself with um, performance under scrutiny or performance under under pressure in it in any in any way shape. You know, yeah. however you measure yourself, if you measure yourself against yourself, and you're prepared to step outside of a comfortable place that makes you uncomfortable, then you'll grow. I believe you grow from that. So this whole season was a, a, a huge struggle, which tested me every day in in a sure. hundred different ways. And this was one of those examples where th- this is a proper spotlight on you, probably an agenda written somewhere. Um, and the ability to differentiate yourself from that external demand. So the external demand of the commentator asking the probing question has got nothing to do with who I am. It's just to do with what people's perceptions are of what's going on. Right. So that ability to stay detached from that and be able to respond in a way that sends the message and the example that I want to send, which is, which was everything to do with what we were doing. We were trying to become this future state. We were doing it against great odds. And I had total belief in that these young players would get there if we gave them the time to get there and i'm not just proud of my response but proud that that was my state of mind and that 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 was my had had my head in the ground so i guess my question now is so had you kind of mentally prepared for any of those questions beforehand before the game or you know in lead up you know what made you think like that or was that just a response you had in the present moment yeah it's about being present it, it it's a uh, um 
in the context of those types of conversations where the media are driving the agenda and driving the questions, then I, I guess by that stage, I'd, I was well versed in, in handling media scrutiny under pressure, you know, every game, post-match press conferences and, and all the rest of it. So I was uh, I'm articulate enough to, to hold a conversation. Of course, when it, it, you're blindsided with a question that's not related to the game that's just been played out. It's just your curve. job. It was your job on the line now. That's the curveball. And, and, and in reality, what do I think of that? From a values perspective, I think it's a pretty low thing to be asking somebody on live TV. I think it's a poor reflection of, of, of the, uh, the, the team that put that question to air. However, I get that the media like a bit of a story. Well, the media like drama, Tony, don't yeah, they? Media course. love drama. So, and so that's, that's like okay. what sells. That's what sells, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but presence doesn't sell so much. But you always, uh, you know, in my experience and what I've learned, you know, having, you know, been meditating for so long is that the presence, even though what other some people may find uh, boring to a certain ex extent in the same, and, and I mean it in the sense that, you know, someone who's unperturbed, yeah. but after a while, if that's their consistent response level, you admire that person for their um, ability to be unperturbed by any circumstances uh, that presents itself and life can be challenging enough um, <laughs> as it is you know and if yeah. you're able to respond you know as you have done and you know in, in what you teach and, and how you coach people and teams and managers that that is fascinating to me because that's that presence is what really differentiates you from underperforming and performing at really high levels yeah, and... I, pre I appreciate that, James. Thank and, and I think I think my natural predisposition is is to be self differentiated. I've always had ability to stay calm under pressure. Now, yeah. sometimes people see that as being he doesn't care enough because you're not like I, I said in the past. I would have had a few histrionics on the sideline, and from the person on the outside looking in, that they'd have their own assumption of <laughs> yeah, he's a crazy guy or he's over remote, you know, they'd have their own perspective of that, which yeah. is not connected to anything to do with me whatsoever, just external. What does that mean for me though? That means, okay, what influence or impact is that behavior having on everybody else? Because as, as a coach at that time, uh, I'm expressing my emotions. So people can see, and it was, it was authentic. They can see that I cared about what was going on. It wasn't actually contributing to moving us forward in the right way so i needed to be to learn how to be a little bit more measured yeah um, it's almost like you're the manager i mean you know i've said this before in previous podcasts is that you know once you get your vibe steady it's like you want that person to be setting the tone so a manager who's composed is the person who's setting the tone for the players because there's a level of expectation and belief in that players that they can perform to a certain ability under pressure. You know, if you look at United under Ferguson, for instance, you know, those particular moments where he completely believed in his team, he managed to man manage every single player differently, like Cantona, he'd, he'd treat him differently than he would like Rio Ferdinand. I remember there was a story in the class of 92, which was Rio Ferdinand had gone out partying and then they would be doing laps in the academy uh, sorry, uh, on the training field. And when he got to Rio Ferdinand, he went, did you have a nice time out? He was like, yeah, yeah, boss, yeah, boss. And he'd obviously, um, you know, had a bit of an injury. So he's coming back from injury and Alex Ferguson had seen that he'd been partying in the newspapers or perhaps even better, he had one of his sort of rogue agents finding out where he'd been going out to a nightclub yeah. or whatever. And he goes, don't ever do that again or you won't be in the team. You won't be in my team. And Rio never did that ever again. But with Eric Cantona, he, he managed him very, very differently and gave Eric, you know, respect uh, and gave him space because he knew that Eric was a, a huge influence on the team and knew that he needed to treat him differently than he did other players. And um, that ability was able not only to remain composed and present, but to meet the needs of each individual because from what I'm understanding from what you're saying is Tony, that you, you need to be present with each person and understand where they are because we don't all function the same way. We all need different 
um, levers to be able to press to get the best out of us. Yeah, hundred percent. And and that's that. So Ferguson would be a, a wonderful example of somebody who knew exactly who he was. So that from 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 that basis, that solid basis, um, comes then his ability to go right. Here's who I am. Who are you? And now that I understand you, this is what I expect from you. So, and he, he obviously did that incredibly well. Now, when I think of my, uh, you know, you grow and mature into knowing who you are, uh, but that takes as much effort or more effort, you know, to look yourself in the mirror and, and look yourself down and go, you know, who are you? Who are you being? Who, who do you want to be? You know, what? what is that and i think if you can become um you know performance is is contextual winnings are out out of your control but everything that you put into getting there is to 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 reach your potential is within your control and if people are able to uh, focus on to understand what it is that um that they're good at, what it is that drains them and know what the motive, you know, he used to think of motivation as being some sort of external thing. He was a great motivator or she's a great motivator. I work for this guy who used to motivate me. Motiva motivations, it's, it's driven from within. So, you know, I'm, I'm amazed that I've got these gauges in reports that I dish out that have got, um, winning matters you score zero to 100 winning matters now you would assume that everybody in a football team or sports team um would have a high score of winning matters but but that's not the case w winning is not the be all and end all for some people it actually it might be the precision in which they make the passes might be the thing that really floats their boat so i i need to know, do i need to put a team together that that's going to win a game yeah that's the ideal or in business do we want a team that's going to achieve the biggest sales that we've that we've that we've ever done before sure that might be that might be the the goal or the, the ambition or the external or the common thing that we're all aiming for which is out of our control then it's about the balance of people and personalities and types and diversity and you know the best teams are full of people with different attributes skill sets strengths gifts and your example of Cantona at one end and say Gary Neville at the other who's a you know a dogged rugged straight up and down defender um, and Cantona who's got the, the, the freedom of Old Trafford to go where he wants and do, do as he pleases then that takes a great level of skill and man management to be able to to allow that allow that to happen and and in a way that makes it work of course it helps if You've got a budget and you can buy world-class players yeah because i've got a really good question here for you tony just to you know i've been thinking about this one listening to your answers like you know how much is in your control and how much is out of your control in terms of winning a game um and how do you prepare for that and and you know i'm also thinking about the individual as well because in the individual you know the the person who settles for i don't know 30 grand a year versus someone who settles for you know, 250 grand a year and above, you know, what's the difference there, you know, and how can someone go from, from that trajectory to the next, you know, in your experience of watching people perform at high levels, what is your, is there something that you've noticed and how you could help people going forwards and, and how you actually help people for, forwards just to allow them to have a little glimpse into, you know, the way you've seen it in your, all your experience. I think I think there's a there's all of, there's all of those sort of and they're not cliches they're important things like resilience for example you know right. in order to even get there in order to become a perfect like ninety nine percent of kids in an academy won't even become professional footballers never mind play I didn't know that ninety percent yeah that's more huge than, more than and right. and and the, the implications around that are then well if you've been in an academy for ten years and identify as a footballer. That's why a lot of people cr 
crash down mentally when they get released from football because they don't identify with anything else. There's right. a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do in that area. So in order to actually just just get there to any level, you've got to have gone through a few hoops and and become a you know determined, rugged, and 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 confident, have strengths and cope with external demands. You've got to be a, quite a rounded. Uh, strong-minded and strong-willed person just to actually get there and and of course at the point where you become a professional it's such an ultra competitive you know and, and it's a global a, a global uh, you know we're only talking about football this applies to industry and, and anywhere there's only the one percenters that are the real the, the clops of the world are, are, are out there on their own the what the you know the real percentage of people that operate at that level um because because everybody's high performance is 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 their own concern to to, to deal with I, did, I didn't articulate that well let, let me put it into this context for you you useful questions for people to ask themselves um about what they need to do to perform better for example it's things like confidence focus emotion goal setting responsiveness we've touched on some of them now so what what do what do my best days look like? How, how does it feel when I'm at my best? So ask yourself that. So, so as, as a player, you've come into the first team, you haven't made your debut yet. You don't know what it feels like to play in, in front of that 20,000 crowd. Um, that's yet to be an experience. So in terms of your confidence to do that, you've got to be leaning on other things to give you the confidence to go and do it. you're going to have to stick your neck out and do it so when the coach says you're in you're in so crack on go and do it no mm. excuses all of that sort of stuff so then understand what when, when all of this feedback is coming in all of these external noises people are saying this the manager wants that my teammates are telling me to do this uh, my wife saying have you put the bins out you know the kids the kids crying because they don't want to do geography today you know what whatever's going whatever's going on um there's a requirement at some point to focus on stuff that's not distracting you from being at your best so what external demands lift your anxiety levels and work out a way to to minimize them in order to, when, when you're asked to perform at your highest level or when you're asking yourself to be at your best, that you know what those things are, park them for the time where you need to be at your best and be okay when you're not. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, you know, Tony, I play tennis, right? So I love playing tennis. I uh, played tennis this morning, actually. And um, very interesting. Like I witness how I'm performing and playing and I'm trying to understand if there's a parallel between what you're saying and when I'm winning, for instance. And I won three games out of four. I won three, three mini matches playing paddle tennis out of four. And the three that I won, I was completely and utterly present in every one of those games. And I so what knew... Do you mean, what do you mean by that? You focused on the each ball as it comes you're just each ball, ball as it comes it. enjoy each shot as i present it and if i make an error it's just an error yeah i don't beat myself up about it whereas i w- watch other people beat themselves up about making an error i just get on and try and play the next point the best i possibly can yeah. now it's not something that i'm thinking about trying to you know i oh, must reframe my focus that's only if i'm off i just had a moment where i was yeah. observing myself yeah playing the game once so i've had a flow, little you're in flow you're fully immersed in the activity I was fully, fully immersed present. in you're flow you're probably loving it enjoying it absolutely and and you know what it, it it was almost as if i was in the right place at the right time hitting the right shot yeah and then i had some people on the sideline at the end of the game going wow you played really well there that was really yeah. great yeah and i didn't need that feedback from them mm. it was just how i was feeling which was i was feeling yeah, really yeah. good and i was highly present but I didn't need the feedback to go, you know, to, to give me that extra lift, but it was nice, but I didn't need it because I was already in flow and all I wanted to do is carry on because this feeling became addictive. 
yeah. it's it, it's that enter that flow state so so put that into context then so let, let let's say um you're any other person in the world or any other player playing a sport whether it's tennis yeah. or, or, or football and you've just explained what your optimum state when you're having your best game you're in that optimum state so that's when i say if you think about a memory what did it feel like that's what it felt like i was just in flow i was hitting the ball sweet it was like you know in cricket they talk about you seeing it like a beach ball yeah you know, yeah. the, you know those cricket david gower in his day just had so much time with west yeah. indies peppering him with, <laughs> with, with, yeah, yeah. With, with bullets you know so so you you know what that if you can if you've experienced that and you know what it feels like that's what the quest is to try and find that repeatable state because it's it's blissful it, it's, but it's almost it's, it's, it's but tony this that high performance level that flow state it, it feels unforced you know it feels just like a, yeah. a it's like it's like you walk out of one room and into one that just everything's beautiful and that's mastery that's mastery of distraction so not allowing the the external influences to take away that your 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 presence not not be distracted from that optimum state and it's not easy to do so some people will have a predisposition to get angry quickly and make a mistake they get off oh, or other people will be head down despondency yeah. and for those periods of time in football when i was a manager and in business when when people are disciplined or, or or something happens that that they don't don't like they 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 can respond more naturally in an angry way or in a despondent way and neither of those things help no they, they both they both it, the opposite it takes, of what you it, want in my in my in my sort of meditative world if i was just going to say you know when when you meditate this i i would definitely say i'm a much better tennis player now than i was when i was a kid when i was playing you know loads of champion yeah. you know like kids championship stuff because i used to throw my racket all the time and there i'm not like a not helpful you know, I, yeah, <laughs> that's not just, helpful is it <laughs> not helpful you know my mum would watch me i'd hate her watching me because you put me off she just so but i always i you know but for me, that there were just things I would go back to my preparation that would make me feel great. But now, because I understand more about flow state and when I'm in it, it feels much better. But what about the people um, who, let, let's see if we can put it into a context of like, uh, you know, people wanting to make money and do well in their work, for instance, and improve their lifestyle and, you know, go from that 30K to 250K plus. What do they need to be thinking about or how do they need to be being? Because you mentioned the presence and you mentioned the being. This is what you found. Uh, you know, this is what you're talking about at the, at the beginning when we first started this conversation. Yeah. What, how do you change that being, Tony? It, it, it's, it's about, ultimately, it's about self-mastery. You right. can't get to that point until you've, got a high degree of self-awareness and then self match so your self-awareness is do i using the last example when something negative happens do i sort of flare up or do i get my head down okay understand that then you can start to work on okay well neither of those things as we've just agreed are helpful so what what works then and and if needed who do i need to talk to to help me find that place until I get it for myself so you know self-awareness will come from your own thoughts as being curious about you know understanding your emotions as they come up and and having the ability to recognize how you responded and all those types of things not easy to do if you don't know how to do it no um, but it's, it starts with that and and I think people in order to be better you've got to stop chasing the things that feel good so feeling good short lived. So if I'm just chasing a result that doesn't happen and it's out of my control, then I'm, it's going to feel bad. And it, and it, even if I get there, it's gone in an instant. So you could, for instance, try and set a goal of I want to make X amount this year. And if you don't achieve it, you feel deflated, Failed. don't you? Failure. Yeah. 
fa from a failure, which is, you know, it's the word it being 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 better is measuring yourself against who you were yesterday and to stretch yourself to a point where you, you actually want to fail. You want to be experiencing and familiarizing yourself with how uncomfortable you are at that stretch point. This is testing me now. This whoa, I, I, actually I'm out on a limb here. But hey, I'm I'm giving it a crack. That feels good. You know, yeah. nobody can hold that against me. Hey, I'm uncharted might, territory, isn't it? Uncharted yeah, and territory. you know what? If if, if I fail, the failure is not not too big. I can I can dust myself down. We got close. Let's try again, and let's just tweak it a little bit. Um, if you lose one nil to a last minute equaliser and the game was 50-50, yeah, that's all right. You might be. You can analyze it till till the cows come home. Did you miss a? chance? chances in the first minute that in the game could have got that all of that stuff's a load of cackle doesn't really matter what matters is when when you you know terms like they left everything out on the pitch did you because that's the thing you need to measure right and, and whether you're in the workplace or you're in the family or you're at school are you bringing everything to what you're doing in that moment are you like, bringing and, and I, everything to the table are you bringing yeah, and yeah. putting everything on the table? Because if you're not, then that's what you've got to measure measure that that gap by. Um, yeah, and and understand and understand why. So, like I, I reflect myself at school. Right, I I was a um, my my school reports would always always have been um, smart lad could have done better. Mate, like, could have tried hard. This tried is exactly hard. same reflection of me. I. I, I mean, it's exactly the same with me. In hindsight, I can look back at those school reports at school. I, you know, I wasn't great at school. In fact, I wasn't even interested at school because it didn't have subjects that, you know, really floated my boat because my work wasn't even, you know, a thing. It wasn't even available then. You know, modeling, that wasn't something that I learned about. Podcasting, that wasn't something about that. Making music and making house music and dance music that wasn't something that was you know readily available that you could do then so I was doing economics and going yeah. oh this is boring but then you know yeah. I go to university and I do it for myself but I, I really want to just really touch upon something that you know I thought you said that was really interesting which is measure yourself on how you used to be because that is you know that's the gap rather than measuring yourself or comparing yourself with other people Mm -hmm. And I remember that there was a brilliant quote by Thomas Edison saying, you know, don't you feel bad? You have made the light bulb like 10,000 times and you failed like 10,000 times or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was something to that effect. Yeah, yeah. He goes, I just learned 900 and, you know, I learned 9,999 ways not to do it. So it wasn't a failure because I yeah. learned all the ways not to do it. Yeah. And, and I, 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 um, you know my greatest struggles and 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 challenges are are definitely you know definitely the best lessons are learned from there if you've got the and and that's about you know being better is tough it's not being better is not you just don't make a choice to be better without making a choice of sacrifice of this is going to be tough at times and taking responsibility for what happens there's no hiding place for being better now you, you can be being achieving the goals that are set by a business or a football team or the, the, and that collective way of getting there. Th then it comes down to communication because because if you're not like at school, I was get, I'm I'm curious. I'm gazing out the window when the teacher's talking. So I'm not interested in what what information's being shared. I know that now. At the time, I probably felt like I was not paying attention when they got yelled at or whatever but it, it's community like businesses talk about culture and culture and team culture and sport culture and I, I see culture as a very low resolution thing it's a big idea that is incredibly hard to to pull together because it it happens in the gaps between what people say to each other so if you're an organization of a thousand people and 10 of the leaders to sit around the table and come up with the, the the great culture and then they think they're going to filter that down to the masses then that's fantastic but only if they're helping people 
across this broad base of the business to have conversations that count. And that's a, there's a lot of new and skill in having those conversations for people to be authentic and speak their mind without, you know, in a, in a sporting team, if I'm put the team tactics on the board and everybody nods in agreement that that's the way we're going to go. And then they go back into the changing room and they've got different ideas and they don't, and half of them don't agree. And some of those people have got strong personalities and the kids in the team think, Oh, if I don't do what he says, I'm not going to, you know, you've, you've, you've got this, yeah, you know, the, 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 the club on the outside going, wow, we're the club of choice and we're this and we're that. But the real culture that's getting played out in those gaps between conversations is where everybody needs to do a lot of work. Yeah. And that's the bit of the work that I enjoy doing the most. Everyone, I keep hearing it. It's like, just focus on the next point the best you can, because yeah. everything else you can't control. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to making X amount of money or, you know, and trying to improve your business, it's just like control what you can do next to the best of your ability. And maybe just maybe you might open the floodgates to something great, yeah. but that is momentum at work. So if I can play the next point and then the point after and the point after that, and I kind of get three wins in a row that creates this new turn of events or new momentum there's an invisible psychology that takes place and it's almost like, Oh, you can see that you can see the momentum shifted. Um, and it's really only a mindset shift, but what you don't know is what's happening in the opponent. Why are they, you know, is it that you're suddenly got this flow on them that it's just working for you or have they somehow entered this downward spiral of, of mentality? It's, it's really hard to understand whether it, what you're doing that's, that's why sports is such an interesting thing. Yeah, and I yeah. always like to use it as a measure against real life because mm. sports is just like a, a micro perspective of real life, you know, and life is a macro perspective. Um, and if you're watching, for instance, tennis or a game of football or whatever, and you watch like, so I watched Man United lose the halftime 2-0 the other day and then they came back and won 3-2. And I was like, yeah. what was it that they did that? They just scored the next goal. Yeah. And then they had a little bit more belief and then they scored another goal. And now they're thinking, God, we've just scored two goals in a fairly short amount of time. Surely yeah. we can wrap this up. And the other team are now on the back foot. Mm -hmm. So they, They're thinking we've got something to lose now. Whereas the other team thinking we've got something to win now. Yeah. See, I, I remember again, I had this assistant coach once um, and I, I am always positive intent. So regardless of the situation, the glass was half full. Even if we were losing, what can we do to do X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. We were playing in this cup game, and uh, it was half time. It was nil-nil. We were playing against the team in the league above, um, and we were playing really well. And the opportunity to win was, was there. So my assistant decided to take it on himself to say a few words to the... In, with good intention. He, right. he was wanting to... But he doesn't have the same, didn't have the same positive outlook that I've got. And he said, whatever you do, don't concede the first goal. In yeah. his thick Yorkshire accent. Don't concede. So straight away sowed the seeds of doubt into their yeah. psyche that, you know. And I'm, uh, I so you're just telling the mind, the mind doesn't care whether you say yes or no. It's just going to listen. And when you're under high emotional um, mm -hmm. environment, you know. Yeah. Then, and I'm going to give you an example now, and it's fascinating. And I asked my friend who's a Liverpool fan, I said, do you understand what's just happened here? Because I understand the mind, but do you understand what happened in this documentary and why it happened? So your friend who was sowing the seeds of doubt that when the, you're under a high emotional stress, or I don't want to say high stress, I was just want to say when the emotions are way out, it means that your physical energy in the moment, your electromagnetical energy is wide open and that means anything yeah. that's going to come into your environment is going to be much faster and in sports analysis it means that you what's going to happen in the game is going to be determined much much quicker so having that positive intent as you had is really important stevie gerrard i think they'd got to uh i can't remember if it was a champions league final that he was in but he said to his team when it was going to extra time look at look lads we've got this far don't slip up exactly and guess who slipped up 
Stevie Gerrard yeah, was the one who killed. slipped up and the yeah. guy got past him and scored a goal and that was the winning goal and he lost it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's because he used it, that language and didn't even realise that he was using that language. And for me, yeah. that's fascinating because I see it over and over again. But the it's, fee- it's the same as it, the number of times I've heard people say 2-0 um, lead's the worst lead to have. Because if you concede the next goal, then the momentum... That's shifts. already seen a doubt already, isn't it? Give me, a, give me a 2-0 lead at the start of every game. I'd be winning the Champions League every year. Yeah. <laughs> and Roger Federer is quite interesting in sports because Roger likes to get out and be a front runner. He just wants to win. It's like, let me just win that first one. He'll eye up the opponent, see if they've got any seeds of doubt, and then just go, I believe in my serve. Bosh, get that run. And, you know, on occasion, he'll let that person serve first because if, he, if they've got any doubt, he'll know because he yeah, reads yeah. people. Fantastic. Let what them athlete. serve what it. Let him serve player. it out. And if they've got any fear, he'll, you know, pounce yeah. on them and so that he can break their serve and trust his. And before you know it, you've got your first break already in the first set. And then yeah. see you later, everybody, because I'm just going to run away like road Turn runner. The screw. Turn the screw. Exactly. But whereas Novak Djokovic is super interesting because Novak Djokovic has somehow managed to be in a master at distracting being distracting everything especially when the whole crowd is against him mm. you know in a bbc one documentary on wimbledon he said when the whole crowd was shouting for roger in the wimbledon final <laughs> he pretended that the whole world was like shouting for him how do you do that in the Wimbledon yeah. final, 2018? He's got a phenomenal mindset, hasn't he? Or well, 2019. Roger, they, both, they, they all do. That and you're level. like, come on, that is formidable. Yeah, to yeah. be able to do that under that pressure, that's respect. Yeah. And, I, oh, and, and I, I look at these people and I think, I want to take what the things that I listen to yeah. and I observe and I want to put them into my own life and try them out. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, whether it's a micro perspective, like playing a fun game of tennis or whether it's in business, I want to just apply the same principles over again and let my own hero's journey unfold in that way. Yeah. And, um, you know, speaking to you and, you know, having, you know, listening to your experiences of what's worked for you when you've been managing teams in Australia and, and you know, doing the academies and stuff like that here in the UK. I mean, I find that absolutely fascinating. So, Tony, it's been amazing speaking to you. I feel like this conversation is unlimited. It could go on and on and on. Um, And I'd love to have you back on the show at another point in time so we could go into a little even more depth because I feel like we've only just got the ball rolling. But if we were able to, if you could, just give me like a bullet point answer, two or three takeaways people could take away now. Okay, I would say if I'm summing up... To summing up the com- the conversation, I would say three takeaways would be familiarise yourself with a bit of discomfort. I-, I would say in terms of communication, say what you think and mean what you say and then check for understanding because often what you say is misheard because someone else is listening to it from a completely different perspective. And from a performance perspective, if you're going to measure anything, measure the intensity that you're doing what you're doing at and if you're serious about it put enough in into what you're doing in the present moment be fully immersed like you were at tennis this morning when you're fully immersed in it and time flies by you know you're in the right spot right easier said than done though isn't it to like not know yeah if it was that easy we'd all be earning millions and and winning football leagues all the time and so, Tony, if people wanted to find you, where can they find you online? Where, you know, where can, I know you've got a few courses and, you know, I know you've got a few things coming up. Where could people find you online? I'm at www.theleadersadvisory.com. Fantastic. I'll have that link below here as well. Tony, it's been amazing talking to you. And I know you're helping a lot of people right now. And um, I very much look forward to seeing your journey as you continue. Um, but thanks for coming on the show today. Much appreciated. Thanks, James. I, I absolutely loved it. And it, I went to places I wasn't expecting to get to. And I always love conversations like that. Thanks Fantastic. very much. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks for tuning in today. Today, I've been speaking to high performance coach specialist, Tony Wormsley. And as always, I wish you green lights all the way.